<laughs> okay, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to um, many of you. I think we've maybe got a few new faces today, maybe. don't know. Loose track. Um, so the stage two hearings follow on from the stage one. Some of you will have already will have attended those as well. As you know, my name's Louise Crosby. I'm sat next to me is Elaine Worthington. So we're the inspectors appointed by the Secretary of State to carry out the independent examination of the plan. Most people will have spoken to Kerry Truman um, and met her. So she's here for um, the duration of the hearings. Um, outside of the uh, hearing hours, you can contact her by email or phone if you've got a problem. Um, the, there's a few housekeeping points. So firstly, can everybody hear? I think the mics sound better today, actually. I think we got turned up a bit yesterday. Um, apparently, there's no drill, uh, digging of holes today. They're filling the holes in, so hopefully that's a bit quieter. Um, the microphones, for anybody that's not been this week yet, to turn them on, you use the right hand button. When you finish, turn them off. It's important that you use them because the recording that's taking place picks the um, picks up the voice from the uh, from the microphone. They are quite sensitive to voices, so if you don't want somebody to hear what you're saying to your colleagues sat next to you, if you turn them off, it's probably wise. And uh, I think that's probably in terms of microphones. The sessions are being recorded. Does anybody object to being filmed? No. OK, so they're recorded and then they're uploaded at the end of the day. So I think day one's on there now. I'm not sure day two's up here. Yeah, we checked day one. Uh, it's not on yet, but I've just contacted uh, the uh, ICT department and they're just on it at the moment. So it should be on ASOP, I'm told. Right, OK. So, yeah. So that's kind of the cycle that's happening with those. Um, so if people need to refer back to them, they can be quite handy. Um, if there's a fire, it's likely to be the real thing. Um, so we'll go out of these doors here and agree to follow Mr West to the car park. He'll lead us out safely, hopefully. <laughs> be nice to him. <laughs> um, toilets are outside on the landing and there is a vending machine um, to buy drink, hot drinks. Um, and I think there is water, well, there's water on the table for people speaking as well, provided by the council. I think that's, is the press here? I haven't had them here yet, but no? Okay. So there is some guidance notes that explain more about the examination. And we've identified a number of matters and issues um, for this stage of the hearings to be investigated. And those take account of the representations made on the plan and the additional evidence. So today's hearing session will be based on um, these matters and issues. There are some proposed main modifications um, that, the, that the Council have drawn up and they're on GC4M. And the latest version of that is July 2024, so they keep superseding it as they update it. Any main modifications that come out of these hearing sessions will be added to that, um, and the combined list at the end of the hearings um, are likely to need consulting on and may need further sustainability appraisal. <clears throat> so the session is open to the public to observe, but only people around the table with a nameplate are able to speak. Um, also, it's the hearing sessions are not an opportunity for participants to introduce points that were not included in the Reg 19 statement or in response to the Council's um, consultation earlier this year. I also stress that we're not hearing evidence about emission sites. Should we find that the Council need to allocate more sites, it will be the Council to do that. We'll have a mid-morning and mid-afternoon break, similar time to yesterday, so half 11 and it was three o'clock-ish yesterday, and lunch break will be half past 12 to half past one. Um, if you make sure you're back at your seat after each session so that we can kind of get on quickly with things, I think it'll be another full, fairly full day today. So the hearing sessions are relaxed and informal discussions focusing on the particular matter being considered. Um, we've produced an agenda for this session, and that's based on the original matters and issues. Don't think we've added any questions to this one. I think it just as the original yesterday had additional questions, but there are quite a lot of questions already on this agenda. Um, so we'll be asking a series of questions and asking the council and others to contribute, similar to what we have done in previous days. And everyone will be given an adequate opportunity to speak if you wish to do so. 
Um, today, I think the easiest thing, again, we've got quite a lot of people um, and we'll play it by ear. Some of the questions, I think, where there's quite just a few people likely to participate, I'll just ask you to put your name plates on end, where it's a topic that's quite generic and I expect lots of people to take part. I think we'll do the sort of system we have of going sort of around the room. I think that's the easiest way and fairest way. Um, if you're not used to these events, don't worry. Make sure you have an opportunity to speak and um, contribute. If You don't need to repeat comments from statements or ones that other people have made. So um, if somebody's already said it, then it doesn't carry more weight by, uh, based on the number of people that have said uh, the same thing. So I think that completes all the opening and um, housekeeping matters. Is there any questions before we move to the agenda? No. OK, so a couple of points in terms of before we start on the agenda. So there's some main modifications relevant to policy SP2. I haven't highlighted them yesterday, but for anybody that wasn't here yesterday, uh, 001 to 004 from memory. Um, also highlight ID um, 44, which I've highlighted in the last couple of days for anybody that's not been here. Um, so that kind of clearly sets out our position in terms of the future numbers that are um, out of consultation at the moment linked to the MPPF. So where most author local authority areas are seeing a massive increase potentially down the line in terms of um, housing need. Um, and what we've said is we're not we're not so worrying about those at the moment. They're for the future. We'll deal with what we've got before us now, and base and, and this examination will be based on the LHN 2020 figure. Uh, and similarly with Black Country needs, people have raised over the last couple of days and in hearing statements um, about the ongoing work in the Black Country and the figures that are starting to come out of that work. Um, but that. Those it's fairly early days with those. There's not anything at examination yet, and certainly none of those figures have been tested. So we're working to the 1,500 homes and 30 hectares of employment land in this plan still. We're not going to have a big discussion about whether that number should be higher or lower or whatever. Um, as I said, it could go on forever. If you keep changing these things throughout an examination, it takes forever to get to the end of it, and you do have to sometimes draw a line under things and um, and, and stick with them. I don't think there's anything else. Is there anything else the council want to add before we start? Just trying to cover what we've covered in previous days as well, so everybody hears the same message. And <laughs> no, because the other point was about the employment site, which isn't relevant to today, is it? That's for next week. Yeah. OK, thank you. So if we turn to the agenda, we've split it into three areas. So housing need, housing requirement and housing supply. Hopefully that keeps it a little bit simpler. Um, so there's quite three quite distinct areas. So the first topic is on housing need. Um, only a couple of questions. And um, I don't think too many people were made um, detailed comments on this. So what I propose to do with this one is um, I'll let the council speak first um, on question one. And then if you want to speak, if you put your name plate on end and I'll bring you in um, and then defer back to the council. OK, so Mr West, do you want to say anything on this or? I'll just give a very short summary of the, the council's position just to set the scene if you like. Uh, hopefully that'll be helpful. Um, the base date in the draft plan is 2016, uh, and as, as we know, the, the LHM, which underpins the strategy, is, is 2020. Uh, the, the Council considers that the retention of the 2016 ba base date is ent entirely appropriate um, and consistent with uh, the guidance provided with uh, National Planning Practice guidance, and in particular, uh, that on Housing and, e and Economic Needs Assessments, ID2A. Um, in particular, we'd note that paragraph eight uh, of this guidance states that uh, LHN should be assessed at the start of the plan making process and should be kept under review, as the council has sought to do. Um, I, but in, in, do, in providing that guidance, there is no suggestion that there would be a, an equivalent need to update the plan period. Mm -hmm. We consider that is entirely logical 
because all the discussions that occur in the preparation of a plan are predicated on that start date. Um, added, uh, added to a the housing uh, and economic needs assessment, MPPG continues at paragraph 12, stating that the method provides authorities with an annual number based on a 10 year baseline, which can be applied to the whole plan period. So again, there's no suggestion that that should be looking forward. It's 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 a, an, an indication that the LHN can be applied to the whole plan period. The, the reason the council has concerns about proposals to amend the base date to 2020 are several. Um, firstly, I think it comes down to the characteristics of Shropshire, which are perhaps uh, somewhat distinct from many other local planning authorities. Uh, I mean, yesterday we discussed the issue of uh, how the council has windfall allowances for individual settlements. And the reason we take that approach is because Shropshire is such a large geography uh, with very different settlements, very different characteristics. And we feel that approach is more responsive to our character. Uh, this is a similar issue in that the guidelines provided to each settlement are all predicated on the 2016 base date, which were informed with by the engagement that we undertook with the community through the plan making process. If the base date for the plan period was updated to 2020, not only would the proposed housing requirement for Shropshire need to be updated, but every settlement guideline would equally need to be updated to reflect the completions that occurred before that base date. Um, having had very positive, sometimes challenging, but positive discussions with our communities, we understand that there is a risk that this could cause confusion if we start to set a different target, if you like, for communities. Um, through the process, we've often explained the difference between the guideline and what's extra to be delivered. And the, the real concern is that this would muddy all those waters in terms of the, the, the consultation and engagement we've had with communities. So what is it they actually are required to deliver now is often, uh, I mean, we've heard, heard from communities such as uh, uh, such as London, where it was identified as a particular concern, and what we don't want to do is increase that uncertainty. Uh, the, the evidence base that underpins the local plan is also aligned with the 2016 base date. The council's not of the view that updating to 2020 would invalidate that evidence, but clearly it would again have the potential to cause uncertainty. Um, so in, in, our, in our view, there is no requirement within uh, legislation or guidance for the base date to align, but for the base date of the plan to align with the base date for the LHN. And because of the negatives that would be resulting from that, we don't feel that that's appropriate, but clearly others may have different views. So I think that sets the, the groundworks. Thank you. Yeah, I think the key issue was it's about this sort of double counting as it's called, isn't it? So you've got you, you've got an undersupply that, in theory, has been taken in. Sorry, an oversupply, which was it taken into account in terms of LHN. In theory, that was the idea of LHN, wasn't it? That it's sort of wiped out any under or oversupply previous to that date, um, and then you're sort of moving forward with that. Do you want to comment on that? Then I'll ask the, the people. The, uh, um, the vagaries of. Um, calculating need over time are at the mercy of the government policy makers. Um, this council started its plan making process, as do others, sometime prior to submission, some years prior to submission. And the advice is quite clear. You start with a base date. Um, and while you are bringing forward the plan, you are supposed to review housing need so that um, you use the most up-to-date method when you submit. That's what this council's done. And for the reasons set, given by Mr. Calden, we don't think that making any changes to that are required in order to make the plan sound. Um, there might be good reasons for changing it, 
but they're not reasons that go to soundness. Other authorities might have changed their base state in these circumstances, but that wouldn't necessarily be not sound. There are more than one ways of achieving a sound plan on this issue, and this council has chosen this way. Thank you, Mr. Richards. I'll, is there anybody else wants to? Good morning, Mark. Yes, I have first. <clears throat> um, uh, 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 just a quick one. Um, I, I think our concern is paragraph 31 says local plans and reviews of local plans should be based on up to date evidence. And uh, uh, I think the point I'd like to make to you is, is the up-to-date, is the evidence presented up-to-date and proportionate? Um, our view is possibly not, and the Council have obviously sort of taken the, the contrary view to that. Um, I think we set out in our statement um, what the implications of changing the base state would be in terms of numbers and sort of what should be added and what should be added, what should be taken off and what should be added on. So I, I went through a load of numbers at you to try and write down and that, that's there in our statement. So ultimately, if it is to change, then there is scope to do that. And clearly, you know, we are still at examination. And if matters do need to change and the plan needs to be updated to reflect that more up-to-date evidence, then there is scope to do that. Um, simply saying we don't want to do it is, um, I don't think, the, the correct approach. Thank you. Mr Richard said he thought it wasn't a soundness issue. Do you have a view on that? So 35, paragraph 35, again, justified based on proportionate evidence. So whether the evidence is proportionate, either whether it's up to date or not, I think you, you, we would argue that it's not justified. So there is a soundness issue by not using proportionate and up to date evidence. Thank you. Mr Burns. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, thank you for raising the issue about potential for double counting um, at the very start. Obviously, Mr Richards has suggested that isn't a soundness issue, but the council have told us that the housing need is based on the 2020 local housing need assessment, which obviously then they've applied an uplift to. Um, we still don't know whether the potential for double counting has been taken into account when, when doing that exercise. And it is a soundness point because of that reason. Thank you. I'll bring the council back in with two people there. I think one, Mr. Burns raised a question, if you like. He's not sure whether the double counting's been taken into account. I'm not sure that it was, but. No. Uh, and um, whatever the consequences of, of following government policy are, whether whether you end up on a swing or a roundabout, um, if, if you follow government policy, that's the consequence that the government accepts will be built into the system. Now, there will be swings and there will be roundabouts. Um, but all we've done is to start plan making with a base date of 2016. Nobody criticizes that. And then we've done what government policy says and um, used the most up-to-date assessment of local housing need, which happens to be the 2020, um, uh, before prior to submission. And then we've submitted. So wh why is that wrong? Um, there are swings and roundabouts inherent in that approach in government policy. Thank you. Did you want to say something else, Mr. Pierce? Or no. Mr. Burns, you want to? No. Uh, Ms. Wilson, isn't it? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mom. I see you at the back for the sun. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, they're not piling over this side today. Um, are you happy for me to? Um, concede some time to my colleague Shruti Trevidi, who is legal representative of Bunningdale Homes for a moment. That's fine, as long as you talk on different points, I'm happy for it to sort of hot seat, if you like. On... We, we, will, we will do, ma'am, thank you. Um, 
I'll keep it very brief. It's literally just to respond to the legal soundness point. Um, and just chip, chipping in on that point, whereas I'll leave the planning evidence to, to Ms. Wilson. Um, I must concur with the other members of, of the audience today who've expressed concern about the soundness test. Um, I think the point is as simply very effectively summed up by Mr. Birds here, where, you know, we're relying on a base date of 2016. Um, even in the sessions I sat through yesterday and today, it is clearly emerging as we hear more evidence uh, that there's a number of factors going on here in terms of what evidence is coming to light. Uh, fully appreciate the council's position and the difficulty that happens when plans run on for so long and the evidence base has to be given that, that length of time in emerging. Uh, but when you're looking at a base date of 2016, uh, by the time we look at what other bits of the calculation feed into that, uh, by the time the plan could potentially come into adoption, say 2025, uh, we are nine years away from that base date that's been looked at. Um, it, it is in the hearing statements, I believe, that Ms. Wilson has submitted uh, as part of our, our submissions, that that does impact on everything, has a knock-on impact. And I do believe that fundamentally does okay. go to the legal soundness test as well. So I would like to go on record to say that we do agree with the point made by Mr. Birds that there is a legal soundness issue here. Thank you. Did you want to speak as well, Ms. Wilson? I think Yes, if I may, it, it, it is indeed a very brief point. Um, I, I do appreciate that we are, um, in, you know, looking at a plan that has utilised LHN um, as its starting point for calculating housing need. But just to, to, to be very clear that LHN, obviously, um, the LHN from 2020 is, is, uh, has been utilised for the purpose of this and under the transitional arrangements that is, is entirely appropriate. However, with the base date of 2016, it's, it's worthwhile noting that there have been considerable and a number of additional updates in terms of household population projections and subnational population projections. And what I would say is that as part of the exercise, the council have looked at growth scenarios to apply um, uplifts uh, and to assess need beyond that simply set out within local housing need. Uh, and I think it goes without saying that we don't disagree with the approach taken by the council in terms of an uplift. But what I would say is that relying on a 2016 base date has caused some issue with regard to the validity of the evidence, the evidence base and some of the more dated elements of that. Thank you. Well, the, um, the, the, the Marin's um, matter statement that deals with this at paragraph 2.1 and 2.2, their solution is to extend the plan period. That's what they contend for is the solution. Um, to the question you've asked. They don't say what's been said this morning. I think that's two separate issues, isn't it? Well, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, I see what you mean. I thought... You... Sorry, I misunderstood what you meant there. Is there anybody else whose name play I can't see? Just wave here if you feel like. No? Okay. I think I've got the points that, that have been made there. Does the council want to say anything else before we move on? I think it's, it's really a matter no, of. That's, so. No, I think, I think we're satisfied. Um, question two what, what's the identified? affordable housing need. I'm not sure we need a great deal of discussion on this. I don't think there's a huge amount of this. We've got the council's points. Um, I'm happy to take those as read. Unless, does anybody want to say anything on this? I, mean, I don't think there's a lot of... Oh, Mr Cook. Yeah, so, so yeah, sorry. It's only a, a brief point, really, and, and it is set out in my statement, but um, having read the council's massive statement, um, obviously when they were all submitted, just wanted to put a point of clarification really. Um, <clears throat> and that is obviously we all seem to be agreed that the um, affordable housing need is 799 households per annum. Um, but then the council's matter statement then goes on to sort of not it, it, it clarify that, I suppose, and sort of erode the, the, the significance of that figure because it is a significant figure. Um, and the point that's made um, in their matter statement from 2.3 on to 2.7 is essentially that 
um, there are obviously affordable housing need has many components, including existing housing and people in existing need, etc., as well as just new development needs. Um, but the point I wanted to make really was that the um, the evidence base, um, so document EV 92.02, uh, page 50 sets out how that 799 is derived and it, I just want to make clear that, that 799 is the net additional need um, and the, the um, existing people and existing homes in need has, has been already been factored in and subtracted from that figure um, and the inference from the council statement is that they are within that figure I just wanted to make clear that that need is the net additional need. Thank you. Thank you. The council want to say anything on that? Just, just by way of clarification, the way the assessment works is that the the, the point we are, we tried to explain in our our statements uh, is that there is a very there's a there's a distinction in terms of how need is calculated in the context of LHN and how need is con uh, calculated in the context of subgroups, including for affordable housing. That's specifically recognised within MPPG, and we've we've quoted that within uh, paragraph 2.4 of our matter statement. Um, because of that distinction, it looks at the entire population rather than the additional population, and that is how the calculation of affordable housing works. What that means is that the way that the need can be met is also different. It's not just about new provision, uh, and we've given the scenario in our assessment where existing households in many instances are in affordable housing but that affordable housing is not meeting their need but through the provision of new affordable housing that does meet that need other forms of affordable housing are freed up which are capable of meeting needs so the 799 figure we completely recognize is a is an affordable housing need that's been identified in Shropshire what we're saying is that there are more mechanisms than simply provision of new affordable housing to meet that need. And that's why it's distinct from the LHN, which is looking at the need for additional housing. Uh, and it's just trying to draw out that distinction between the two. Thank you. As you understand it, there's no real dispute on the numbers. I think generally most authorities have a massive affordable housing need that can't be met by... I mean, the answer to your question is in paragraph 2.2, 2. it's 799. Yeah. The subsequent paragraphs in this section are really the run up towards the later question. What's the requirement? Yeah. But the requirement for uh, normal housing would have to be astronomical to meet that need. I think that's generally the uh, across the country is the, the situation, sadly. But uh, no. Is there any points anybody wants to make on that? I don't think it's in dispute, any of that, is it? No. Okay. Moving on to um, the housing requirement. So I've got quite a few more questions under this. So the first question is the approach to calculating the housing growth and housing requirements set out in the council's updated housing and topic paper, uh, a minimum of uh, 31,300 dwellings over the plan period, uh, justified, positive repaired and consistent with national policy. I see this is quite an overarching question that probably a lot more people are going to want to um, come in on. So I think probably the easiest way to do this is if you put your name plates on end, but if there's lots of you, I'll just sort of go around in a logical way around the room. I think that's probably the easiest. Do the council want to say anything before we start on this? Uh, I, I don't think we need to add too much more to what's in the matters. Uh, thanks, Mom. Uh, just to obviously just to purely to state our position on that is is our position on that is yes, we do consider it to be uh, positive, positively prepared and the rest. Uh, our uh, rationale for that is in the topic paper. Uh, so I don't think we need to say too much more than that at the moment, but obviously happy to respond as, as needed to questions as we go. Thank you. So if you put in name plates up, if you wish to speak on this point, maybe I'll overestimated how much interest there would be on this. <laughs> I can't see you from Mr Pollard. Thanks, Mom. Um, appreciate your opening comments on this one, Charles, and hopefully 
I'll try not to just replicate what's in the hearing statement and points we've been made we've made previously on this one. I guess the key concerns we've had throughout uh, the plan making process, the examination hearing session, is that <coughs> there is a risk that needs are not provided for, that the number, the, the requirements or the need is under, understating the full extent of that. I know your point regards, and I know the point made by the council around I think, swings and roundabouts of government policy uh, and where we uh, currently sit on that, that roundabout. But there is an under, underarching objective of the government policies with a significant concern around under provision of housing and the need to make sure that housing needs are met. That is the principle, the justification between why we sit here with uh, planning reforms, which suggests significantly different housing numbers, which is alluded to already. I guess <clears throat> where we get to in terms of the council's evidence and its approach, and I think this was, I wasn't here on matter one, but I think it was discussed to some extent there, is that the council's approach using the standard method, again, conforms with current national policy, etc. And then they've applied a, a high growth um, adjustment, which is a proportionate adjustment. Again, we've been clear to strongly support a principle of going above um, a standard method. The challenge is obviously whether or not that underlying figure is robust sufficient, because if you apply a proportion to a small number, you get a relatively small uplift and that's part of the reason why the numbers seem to have gone down in terms of local need in the area. So I think where we've our concerns throughout have flagged that the council's evidence base could have taken a in being a proportionate evidence base and justified could have taken a different route in how it assessed that uplift and how it assessed the robustness of the starting point which is in accordance with MPPG is, is a starting point you are um, allowed to look at it, encouraged to look at it in terms of historic delivery rates, in terms of the relationship with employment. Now, I know you touch on this for a few more questions. We would say that if you were looking at that evidence base in a more proportionate, justified way, you would get a different answer in terms of whether or not that uplift is proportionate and whether or not the starting point is right. And again, it's worth framing where, where do we get to in terms of planning reforms? A much higher housing number, where would you get to if you applied an approach where you're trying to balance jobs and housing more act, more in an even stronger alignment here, a higher housing need? So I think there's a framework, on a, a framing point underneath that the need could, could be higher um, than it is suggested. We put out under in, in our hearing statement our suggested uh, approaches to, to how to address that in, in our hearing statement, paragraphs 10 and 11, and I won't won't repeat those. So I guess it, it, it's an overarching point that we've made consistently that there is a risk that needs don't get met, and that obviously goes against government's objectives, be it look at it on the need front or in terms of how it's responded to by supply, and obviously that feed for a number of questions. Thank you. Do you want to come back on that? Or would you rather I take a few and then? Well, just to, just to address that point. Yeah. We're, we're grateful that there's agreement that we've started in the right place so far as the starting point is concerned. So that's tick. We're grateful that um, the uplift that we have made from the starting point is recognised. Tick. The criticism appears to be we haven't uplifted enough. Um, and um, the Miller Holmes matter statement of paragraph eight identifies four bullet points, um, including matters that are well known to the inquiry. The black country needs might be bigger than 1500 and so on and so forth. That's not a soundness, soundness issue. That's just a matter of judgment. Um, uh, and we've been through already in, in, the, in, in the stage one hearings uh, why we've taken the approach we have. Yeah, and just if I may, uh, I would also point out, I think the the underlying concern there was uh, it sort of got to back to reasonable options for uplift, I think, was the issue. And I think that's been dealt with quite significantly, you know, our position on reasonable options, reasonable options for calculating a hazard requirement. We've taken that through an essay process uh, and the option we have provided for is indeed the high growth option, which is entirely uh, in line with the submitted version of the plan. Uh, thanks, Mark. Thank you. Mr Cooper. 
bit of a concern that um, between the and being submitted and now, we've moved from expressing the housing requirement as being around to a minimum. And yet, when the updated sustainability appraisal was carried out, we kept the same percentages of uplift as previously. And um, we don't appear to have given very much consideration to the significance of changing from around to a minimum. Is there a point above that minimum at which we might conclude that development is not sustainable across Shropshire? And then when we go to the individual settlement strategies, which we heard yesterday in the discussion about windfall, is a material planning consideration when you know, assessing applications. Um, again, we are still on a round. So I mean, how, how did the numbers add up and um, what actually defines what is sustainable at the county level and at the settlement? Thank you. So that change came about as a result of inspectors um, to reflect the MPPF's requirement to significantly boost housing supply. Um, I'm not sure there is a ceiling, if you like, but I think naturally um, there is a ceiling. And, and through development management process, I suppose if applications are not sustainable and there's issues, then they would be refused. Um, I don't know, I don't know the council want to say any more on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, the uh, Mr. Cooper, obviously we've we've altered or proposed to alter the uh, the, the I suppose the framing of the housing requirement as a minimum in line with inspectors' interim findings, uh, and we're happy to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, a ceiling, uh, it's we work in a, a world of development uh, management. Uh, the policy framework, as we set out in in the plan, is the mechanism for managing development appropriately. What we have with the housing requirements is uh, a figure. All plans need a figure to work to. Uh, and what we have said in our proposed policy around managing housing development, which is SP number seven in the updated local plan, is that that housing requirement and the, and the settlement guideline is a significant material consideration in decision making. And what we do in that policy is identify uh, options if in the scenario where either that's that material, that uh, guideline for the settlement is being exceeded or not being met. And there's implications for both, as we discussed yesterday. Uh, it's a it's to provide inbuilt leeway in the plan to manage development in that way. So uh, we didn't start the plan with a minimum, but that's where we are because we're responding to the inspector's concerns. I think the other point was around settlement guidelines still saying still saying around, and I think that's probably appropriate, isn't it? Because minimum is an overarching one, but the, within certain settlements, there might be a reason why. You don't want the minimum. It, it's around because of the constraints of that. I mean, I, I agree with that. Absolutely, Norman. Yeah. That's the yeah. entire reason why we have kept proposed to keep that as around. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad you consider that to be an appropriate uh, choice. Yeah, I mean, that seems wholly sensible that, that there is that difference, and there and there is a reason why you need to have that difference. Isn't there? Uh, Mr. Hodson. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just to support the uh, council, could you highlight uh, what the community's view of your greatest option was? So I believe that uh, you did survey um, the communities across Shropshire to review the high grades plus 
and the high growth option. Perhaps it might be worth just highlighting what the results of that were, so just to show that it's a community led plan that you've gone for. Well, I think the questions really come from us. It's not this is an opportunity to ask the council questions. It's really if you're seeking some changes or concerned about something, really. Um, I mean, if that's something you need the answer to that you don't know the answer to, maybe the council can help you with that outside of the. Uh, yes, very happy to have the conversation. But I, 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 I suppose reiterating the point that those options were subject to public view and that was a consideration in the process, but happy to have a conversation about where to find that uh, background information separately. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Oh, Mr. Kell, sorry. I, I think my thing within the wrong play, never mind. Um, I will be very brief because um, you, you heard from Mr. Green on Monday and I, I don't want to lengthily repeat what Mr Green said, but clearly it's our view that the council has made a choice um, to uh, exceed the standard methodology by the higher growth level, and you have that in front of you. And we believe for various reasons, including the sustainability of the updated sustainability of appraisals flaws, that that choice is not justified, prepared, or consistent with national policy. So following on from what we've said about that, as regards to this question, our view is that the council should have taken the standard methodology figure and there was no need for an uplift. Um, if I could just say one other thing by way of um, a comment, it relates to our thing. There's, there has been people who've referred to the new standard methodology, and I know you're, you're, you're quite rightly are leaving that for another day, have stressed increases. Um, I think it's important to note, and I think this is in regard to your approach is correct, because it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't in increase everybody's housing numbers. And uh, if, if it went forward as it is, there will be significant diff impacts on the conurbation, which would be very different and would have impacts on an awful lot of other plan making. So it isn't simply a case that everybody's numbers go up, as, as, as has been mentioned. But I just wanted to make that point um, uh, because I don't think it's quite as simple as, as this sometimes being presented. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kells. I don't know whether there's anything you need to comment on. Anybody else? No? OK. So we'll move on to um, question two now, which um, what provision is made within the plan to fulfil identified unmet housing needs of the black country? And will the plan's approach be effective in addressing the sustainability, the sustainability within the plan period um, in accordance with national policy? The council wants to say anything before we start on that? I'm happy if you don't want to, if you I don't feel like think we you need to. I think, I think we've, I think you know the answer. I think you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, does anybody want to say anything on this? We've well, obviously read statements, so if you think. <laughs> Madam, very shortly, you do know the answer from um, TSC's position, and it's set out in paragraphs 2.9 to 2.15 of um, Stan Moore's um, uh, response to uh, or hearing statement. Um, Madam, the, the answer to your question, is it effective in addressing sustainably within the plan period the, the, the unmet black country need? We say no, it isn't and therefore fails to meet the um, positively prepared requirement of the NPPF and also isn't effective. Um, and that's because of how they have chosen to um, uh, address a black country need um, with, with sites that are not um, well connected. Um, and that is our position in a nutshell. Um, but I don't want to re emphasize everything I've said before. Thank you, Ms. Coon. Just anything on that? Thank you, Mom. Um, yes, again, do not want to, to go over old ground. Obviously, we have um, raised this on behalf of both my clients, Bonn and Gale Holmes, and, and Gleason Land in our submissions. And indeed, uh, during the Matter One and Matter Two sessions, 
Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Our, our position is, is very clearly that the council have uh, failed to identify the most suitable locations to achieve a sustainable uh, development opportunity to accommodate unmet need. Um, I, I won't labour the point any further than that, um, but just for, for the record. Thank you. Question three, has there been a significant... Oh, un sorry, sorry, I missed one. Mr. Cook. Sorry, Mr Cook. Sorry, <laughs> I've been relegated from the front row, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, it's only a brief point, and it, it is in our uh, statement that we submitted, but I think, the, I suppose the, the point that I was getting at was crystallised for me uh, throughout the conversation on Monday, and that is essentially is that now we are clear i think we're clear in treating the black country needs separately i.e the 1500 sits um separate to the council's lhn and obviously we've heard that the council's lhn has a 15 percent flexibility uplift applied to it uh, the point we've made in our statement is about what happens if none of the one of the identified black country sites doesn't deliver and i i suppose the, the, the point that it was clarified for me on monday is if we are now treating these separately. The question for me is, should the 1500 not also have flexibility built into it? Because if either one of those sites doesn't come forward, or indeed it comes forward, but not quite at capacity, essentially there is no flexibility whatsoever in the 1500. The three sites that have been identified for the black country needs, some perfectly to 1500, no more, no less. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's the point essentially, is there, is, should there not be a flexibility on the 1500 as well? Thank you. So in, in terms of that, do you mean a buffer or do you mean a sort of trigger if, if they're not delivering that? A, a, a buffer. Um, I'm not suggesting, just to be clear, that it should be 15%. Um, I, the MPPF talks about 5%, 10%, um, but the, it seems logical to me there should be some sort of buffer on that, um, you know, in, in case one of those sites doesn't, doesn't deliver. Thank you. So are you answering question two or three here? Because they're sort of a bit... Two. Because when the, we next, go on to the buffer next, I was thinking, oh, maybe you've moved on. Just black country, just black country right, OK. Well, the, the, the question I have is, is question two. And it's a point, fine. It's a point we made at the bottom of our question two. And like I said, that's, it was the, 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 the issue was really clarified for me on Monday in terms of the fact that it's, um, they were treating the two needs separately and there's flexibility on one but not on the other. Yeah, I see, yeah. Uh, thanks, Mum. Uh, I think just to reiterate, really, the the, the 1500 figure is a set figure agreed with uh, our neighbours through the statement of common ground in that context. So that unmet need is a is a, a number. We don't feel as though it's appropriate or necessary to add a, a degree of flex into that. Uh, you've asked us to identify land areas for that to be delivered. We have provided those. We are confident that those areas will be delivered to meet that unmet need. Uh, I think that's all we have to say on the matter. Thank you. And we'll discuss uh, which matter it is, but the one about five year housing land supply, we talked there as well about triggers and um, things not coming forward or whatever. So that might kind of get discussed again at that. Uh, at that juncture. Okay, so question three. Yeah, I think we're just going on to. So this is talking about um, a buffer um, and uh, a five-year housing for a five-year supply of housing sites. Should it be five twenty percent in relation to para seventy-four? Um, I think there's general agreement that it should be five percent. Is there anybody wants to say anything beyond that? It's not my. Yeah. No, that was my impression from reading the statements that that was, and that was the council's view, wasn't it, that 5% is appropriate. So. That was an easy one, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and question four is about 10% of the housing requirements uh, from sites no larger than a hectare. And what the council's saying is you've not allocated any large sites, so it will all come from windfall and you've got evidence that that percentage would come forward based on past trends. I think that's what you're saying, isn't it? 
Uh, there are there are uh, a, a number, a small number of proposed allocations that would meet those that definition. But as 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 you've uh, intimated, Mom, um, there are significant uh, windfall sites that meet that definition that have already been delivered in the plan period or are committed, uh, such that demonstrably we have met that requirement. And we want to comment on any of that. Mm. Okay. So question five, is the updated housing requirement in the plan appropriate alignment forecasts for jobs growth? Uh, the council considers the updated housing requirement is appropriate aligned with the jobs growth forecast. The updated housing and employment topic paper GC45 identifies this alignment in table 17.2 through to 17.6. Which draws, on, which draws on evidence in the Edna. Table 17.2 shows the employment requirement of 320 hectares is forecast to provide 21,400 new jobs by 2038. Table 17.4 shows that the housing requirement for 31,300 dwellings will accommodate 12,615 persons seeking work. Our housing growth would provide up to 60% of our jobs growth forecast, which the Council considers is an appropriate alignment. Table 17.6 goes on to show that the remainder of our jobs growth forecast will support other sources of labour. So these would include rebalancing community relationships with neighbouring authorities, helping to support the Black Country authorities, increasing economic activity in the county and further reducing unemployment and encouraging older people to extend their careers or to return to work. And these objectives form part of wider strategies being um, employed by the council. Do you say table 17.6? I couldn't, oh, I don't think I've got that. It's mislabeled 17.4, but if you go to the end of that section, it's on page 100. Sorry, sorry. Uh, 162. Uh, it's actually mislabeled, actually. Uh, apologies for that. It, but it's it's in 17, chapter 17. Yeah. Uh, it's it's the table on 162. 17.4. 17.4, but it's mislabeled as 7.4. So it should be 17. Apologies for that. Thank you. Does anybody want to uh, say anything on this, Mr. Cook? Just put your microphone on, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at table 7.4 of the um, updated housing and employment topic paper. And we have Employment generation of um, 21,400 um, over the plan period. Um, 4,600 working age migrants. And the balance is made up by influencing commuting patterns and influencing the work patterns of Shropshire's resident population particularly um, the um, economically inactive. If those influences cannot be met or achieved, then the development is not sustainable. How can we be confident that those measures can actually be achieved and produce results? Thank you. The council ought to come back on that. In reaching this approach, the council's looked at the evidence in the Edna. And the evidence there in, in paragraph 8.43 advisors caution over the extent to which housing growth will be used. 
um, that caution is that the majority of the increase is expected to be people over 65s and it will be a challenge to bring to Shropshire uh, working age people. The, the balance of that consideration is that if you look at the, account, the approach that the council is taking, it's looking to target and bring into the workforce uh, people of working age who are already present in Shropshire. And that forms part of the wider strategies being employed by the council in relation to health and well-being, where economic growth and provision of employment is a key route for people to, to, to lead back to social inclusion. Thank you. Has that answered your question, Mr. Cooper? No, not really, to be honest. Um, I'm looking for some evidence that these measures um, can be taken and can be effective. And I suppose with lots of these things, you don't know until <coughs> it's been tried, if you like. It's... The evidence is our economic development needs assessment, the Edna. Uh, and as, we, as uh, has been noted, this is to some degree around labour supply is, is more than a planning issue. It, 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 it revolves around a whole number of strategies. The council's process, its, it's, its role as an economic growth enabler, it's uh, including things like upskilling up population, which is a key part of our economic growth agenda. Uh, so I think there is no absolutes in this, but we think we are confident that there is a significant and growing labour supply that we can tap into. Thank you, Mr Pollard. Mr Pollard. Thanks. And I think you'll see from our hearing statement, we've raised similar issues in terms of acknowledge the judgment, acknowledge it that there are aspects um, of, you know, hard to pin down in the exact evidence elements. So I guess it's a, a judgment from yourself whether 60% alignment is a proportionate uh, robust. I think it's, again, a point I, I come back to is there is a risk that that 60% alignment gets worse if housing isn't provided for at the rate at which it's in, uh, assumed, suggested, you know, shops have proven itself very capable at generating jobs. I'm not I'm suggesting the council's economic strategies are positive and, and well aligned. Again, if there is a risk that housing underprovides, there's an issue with labour supply, and it's important that the plan has mechanisms to monitor and manage that and respond positively rapidly. Can't sort of say any more on that. Uh, I think it's probably just worth pointing out about the sort of the housing element of the um, the labour supply element that we've identified. Uh, I think it's I think it's relevant to also look at housing mix as, as well in terms of the policy uh, agenda and framework around that. Uh, the and we'll come on to that uh, policy in later sessions, uh, but it's. It is aiming uh, at a change to the existing housing mix to aiming at more uh, working families, in effect, uh, at that point. And the and indeed positive conversations we've had uh, with uh, on applications which have come uh, into the arena early. You note that there's some uh, some of our proposals that we are. Uh, are subject to application, actually have been subject to uh, planning applications with approvals as well, and that housing mix has been part of that conversation, and we can see on the ground a change to the housing mix around that area as well. So we're alive to that issue uh, around that, and indeed one of the rationales that the council's proposed around the high growth agenda is precisely to support more working age population. Here. We we recognise it's a challenge for, for, for places like Shropshire, 
uh, but it's a challenge we are seeking to uh, influence through our policy framework around residential mix and uh, growth aspirations, including the amount of housing we propose. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Um, th this is a slightly cheeky question, but since we've got Mr Cowden here and I was looking at Table 7.4, I think it would help this in the context of the, of the employment figures. Um, table, I know it's seven, meant to be 17.4, Madam, but, but the in terms of the projected labour force growth, under migrant labour force growth, it says working age migrants from anticipated trends, including in migration from uh, the black country through meeting the 1500 dwellings of unmet housing need. And, and I've understood that to be what, what I might in my head call total migrants. In other words, people who have who leave the black country entirely to come and live and work. Um, the, the figure of 12,615 is there. Um, is, is there a figure? Uh, or is there a percentage that's been applied in order to arrive at 12,615 that is uh, in relation to those 1,500 um, dwellers <laughs> that have come or migrants from, from the back country? Is, is there a percentage that's been assumed? And I'm sorry. If I, think, I think we'll find the answer in paragraph 514A of the Council's Matter 3 statement. Thank you. If I'm wrong about that, I'll be dug in the ribs from my right. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. You. Gold star. Madam, I'll, I will read that in, in a little bit more detail. Um, if there's anything to come back from it, we might put in a short note on it. But thank you very much, Mr. Rich. Um, indeed, thank you very much, Mr. Rich. And that, that's in response to question five, isn't it, later on? So we can pick it up again there, maybe after a break, when you've had a chance to read it. OK. Any more questions? Points? No. Okay. So on to question six now. Uh, what is the requirement for affordable housing, and is this likely to meet the identified needs? So I think we've touched on that. I think the answer's probably no, but the answer control. against the seven nine nine is is no. It it, it will not. Uh, we don't think that is a a realistic. Uh, uh, prospect for either this plan or indeed any plan uh, in this context. What we have set out is what we consider to be a realistic, achievable, but challenging uh, affordable housing uh, requirements as part of the overall housing requirement to policy SP number two, uh, which is the 7,820 uh, dwellings, which is the it's 25% of the overall housing requirements, uh, and that takes into account the uplift, as well, which is the, you're right. the uh, five hundred uplift. Uh, so it takes it takes that into account. So so that is the proposed main modification includes uh, uh, equivalent uplift to 
that uh, as well. Uh, so that's our effectively our affordable affordable housing inbuilt requirement in the wider requirement, uh, which we think is realistic, achievable, and will make uh, a huge contribution to affordable housing needs in this county. Thank you, Mr. West. Anybody? Ms. Wilson, we touched on this yesterday in terms of other matters, didn't we? But uh, do you want to say something? We did indeed. Um, and again, it is, it's to reiterate the points I made yesterday, um, just with regard to the reapportionment of the three sites to accommodate the unmet need from the Black Country. Um, and uh, what I, I'm, I'm struggling uh, to be able to find the evidence in terms of the impact on that, on the um, the provision of affordable housing, or, or, or certainly the, the impact on the uh, aspirations for affordable housing set out in policy SP2, Mom. Thank you. Do you want to come back on that? Option? It's just a Similar fairly point. basic point, really, to say the the 1500 is obviously incorporated into the overall housing requirement. Obviously, it splits out in terms of the way it's presented, but it's in terms of the total, and that is subject to the, the overall percentage of affordable housing as well. So, effectively, the 1500 will contribute in the same way that any other house in Shropshire will contribute. Thank you. Mr. Cook. Yes, thank you. And this is really just leading off from the point I made earlier in respect to question two. But it, and to be honest, I was about to let it go. But it just it, it, if I can just clarify something that was just said a second ago was that, that the um, Mr. West said that the affordable housing delivery of seven two six zero, I believe, is the figure you said um, seven eight two five. Sorry. Seven, eight. Well, in any event, you, you said that figure was set out to be realistic and achievable. Can I just clarify what you mean by that? Because the query I had really was that it doesn't seem that a greater level was tested um, to, to determine whether it was unreasonable or not, whether the evidence is for that. Um, the, the, the point we all agreed on clearly is that the, um, the, the identified need is 799. And if using that figure that you just provided we're looking at delivering 330 or something like that per annum. I've just done a very quick calculation. The, the difference being the best part of 450, 460 homes per annum, um, which is quite a substantial difference. And I sympathise with the council, and I do recognise that the, the point that was made earlier that affordable need is largely uh, not, not just um, limited to this authority. It's, it's very often excessive. Um, but the, the point I'm, I'm making, I suppose, is that has the council grappled with that difference and actually sought to evidence whether a greater level is, is deliverable? And that the point Mr. West says it's realistic and achievable. I'm sure we can see where that evidence is. I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on that point. But. Thank you. I'll ask the... uh, just, just a couple of points. Obviously, within the discussion about the affordable housing need, we already made the point about how there's a distinction between LHN and how that considers need and affordable housing how that considers need so i won't go over that again um in terms of what i think mr cook is saying is have you have you looked at whether you can achieve 800 well 799 per annum i think as as you've already uh, recognized mom that is incredibly challenging and it, it applies to all authorities to put that in perspective if we were to continue to target around 25 percent of total housing uh, to achieve 799, you'd need to deliver in the region of 3,200 houses per annum in Shropshire. The council of the, is of the view that that is not realistic. Um, what we have set is what we consider to be a challenging but realistic target of 25%. I'm sure we're going to have some discussions about the quantities of provision on uh, market sites and the other mechanisms that the council has identified to deliver affordable housing. And it's through consideration of those, those different mechanisms. So uh, effectively planning gain as part of market housing and then exception sites, cross subsidy sites, the other mechanisms the council identifies, uh, and also the wider activities of the council uh, for our housing enablement function uh, to, to secure the delivery of affordable housing. And it's those factors that has informed our views in terms of what is a realistic, but 
is we as we as we've already recognized it's a challenging target 25 percent will be challenging but we do consider that based on our consideration of those mechanisms it's realistic and achievable as i understand it the viability also fed into this as well didn't it so what's achievable in terms of viability yes ma'am the the specific rates of 10 and 20 percent in the north and south were directly informed by viability um clearly any council would wish those rates to be as high as possible but the council are has had to recognise other demands on development and also ensuring that development remains viable. Uh, and we feel that we've struck the appropriate balance, recognising the different issues that the, that the council is seeking to address through the plan. Thank you. Mr Cook, did you want to come back on that? Uh, only briefly, and I suspect I know what the answer is, but it, it, it seems to me from that response that the answer was no, it hasn't been tested. It was. I was, and to be clear, I'm not expecting the council to be testing 799, uh, but it seems that they're not tested half that. It seems that a figure of 25% has been settled upon, possibly out of viability, and then left at that. Um, it, you know, we, we're talking about over half the identified net need that's not going to be met. And like I said, I'd, I'd sympathise with the position, but it, it seems as if it's been accepted and sort of left at that, really. Thank you. Do you want to say more? Yeah, I just think we have not tested specifically other options around that level. It's incorporated within the uh, reasonable options for housing requirement that we obviously have had an assessment of. So it's been built into that assessment of reasonable options. So, but no, we haven't tested specific alternative options to the twenty-five percent. Thank you. Okay, is that already done on um, was need, wasn't it? So, oh, sorry, requirement. Um, we move next to supply. I wonder if it's just coming up to quarter past, uh, quarter to 11. I wonder if we'd normally break by 11, but I wonder if this is a point to probably have a break before we move on to the next sort of topic. It makes it a bit cleaner. Um, and then we'll move on to um, the supply of housing where there are a lot more questions. So if we break now, it's quarter to 11 till... We say five past, there's quite a lot of people to use facilities and things. So we come back at five past 11. Okay, thank you.
Okay, it's just coming up to five past. I think everybody's back. Um, so I'll turn back to the agenda to a supply of housing land. <clears throat> So question one talks about um, the trajectory and whether the council has an up to date trajectory and where it can be found, etc. Um, and whether it's realistic. We won't get into detail of sites in the way that we will when we deal with sites specifically. So we'll, we'll deal with that then. It's whether it generally seems uh, realistic. So we don't want to get into forensic analysis on particular sites and what the trajectory says about them. Does the council want to say anything before we open the floor on this? See if anyone's got any comments. Uh, I don't think so, Norm. I think I think we've got our master statement, so I'm happy to pick up questions. Yeah. Does anybody want to say anything on this first question? No? Okay. I've got the council's answer on that. I don't think we need any more. <clears throat> question two. Sorry, I choked in my, in the break on a crisp and <laughs> put a frog in my throat. <coughs> Question two, is the housing trajectory and information required by the tables appended to our initial question showing the expected rate of delivery of housing land up to date? Um, and the council obviously responded to that question. Um, we've got GC 47, which provides quite a lot of detailed information um, for the supply. No, I don't think there's much to say. Anybody want to say anything on that? No? Okay. Um, question three, should the trajectory illustrating the rate of housing delivery land over the plan period be included in the plan? So there is something at the moment in Appendix 7, um, which is sort of limited, and, and plans do vary in terms of what they include in it. Some have a more detailed trajectory, some more like what's in here, and then rely on a five-year housing land supply statements and things. And I think that's the council's preferred option, isn't it? That, Yes, that's our preferred option. We do it's regular monitoring, as all councils have to do on that, and that's included in our housing land supply, which is always done a year after the monitoring because of the monitoring the uh, baseline. Uh, and we think that's a sort of a a better place to keep a more up to date position on that rather than a a plan in that context, sort of a, a moment in a moment in the time really that one rather than an update position but you know we are equally happy to do it another way if it's needed to be but we think that's relatively sensible yeah and they're quite big documents these aren't they so um it probably would be quite a big appendices has anybody got any strong views on that particularly no Fine. <clears throat> um question four um, how will the supply and delivery of housing to meet the identified unmet needs of the Black Country be undertaken? Does this need identifying separately in a trajectory, i.e. the expected delivery on sites and listed there, identified to meet the unmet needs on a yearly basis? I just want to add anything on that. I think he felt that it was probably OK built into the existing. Yeah, I mean, our, our approach is as set out. We think it's uh, there's nothing more that we need to add. I don't, I don't think, uh, unless people have an alternative, an alternative view they want to propose about how we monitor those those sites and capture that information. You know, it's it's a, it's a case of how you monitor a site effectively, isn't it? But, um, uh, yes, they'll be monitored in the round with everything else. So don't... Anybody got any points? Miss Wilson. Yeah, yes, Mum, it's, it, it's a, a, a really quite quite basic point, um, just in regard to um, ensuring that that correlates with the way in which the council will monitor their housing land supply effectively. Um, and so, so one assumes that on that basis they will um, monitor their supply uh, with uh, the OMET need incorporated within that. Um, it's just a point that I'm, I'm very conscious is uh, something of a slightly contentious issue in the Oxfordshire authorities at the moment in terms of how they individually monitor supply um uh, you know for for their local authority needs and then that's of the unmet need from oxford so ju just simply um i suppose some clarification from the council that in terms of housing land supply if they are to monitor uh, performance uh, as part of the plan making process um just some confirmation that they will do so um it, with regard to housing land supply also i understand that's the key, that's what's proposed isn't it that you would keep a, a sort of tally if you like Yes, Mom, that's correct. I think the, the other useful thing is obviously the, 
the yardstick, if you like, for the housing land supply would be the, the 31,300 dwelling requirement, which obviously includes the 1,500. So there's no risk of double counting that 1,500, if you like. Uh, but yes, you're right. We would monitor the, the 1,500 contribution separately. And the, the, the identification of specific sites upon which that's delivered allows for that to be, to, to be uh, transparently uh, recorded. Exactly. And I think that was the reason behind it, wasn't it? So that it's much easier to monitor that. Yeah, we understood that the, the intention. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Thanks. Uh, I think I'm clear on that that point, but it was something we noted as well in our hearing statement, the importance of being able to accurately monitor the performance of those contributions on met need and recognising that those sites are providing both local and up met need in most cases. So I guess it's um, the current, I mean, you'll see from my matter 32 hearing statement as well, there's suggestions around the monitoring framework and being as explicit and clear on that as possible. Um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, not wanting to jump back to previous questions, etc. as well, the point made earlier around risk of under-provision, under-supply, we have included within our hearing statement appendix one, which flags I know you don't want to go through side by side, and I'm not suggesting going through side by side, but does highlight some concerns in the council's assumptions around leading times on larger sites in particular, where in GC 47 they set out their leading time assumptions, which are based on sample historic evidence locally. I guess the, the point I would make there is where they list other sites underneath which justify those leading times. The average size of those is 140 six dwellings i think from a quick calculation there are a number of sites including those being relied on to meet on that needs which are significantly larger so the extent to which those leading times and the, even the upper end of those leading times is appropriate and um, to be applied to those more complex sites i think is is, is something we've flagged and raised in our hearing statements and it gets to the heart of whether or not those those sites will adequately deliver and the importance of accurately monitoring progress so it's the leading times for getting infrastructure and getting things off the ground on big strategic sites. That's what yeah, essentially. I mean, the council itself acknowledges in GC47 that there is a, a huge variety of sites. It's a large authority, many different settlements. Um, but in, in doing that, it cites a number of, you know, where they've managed to go from application to first development completions in a relatively tight turnaround. Um, but obviously, as you'll appreciate, and you can see some of the historic um, profiles with some of the larger, more complex sites in the authority that those require, they, those stray considerably beyond the upper bounds of those leading times for the reasons you've just outlined. And it's obviously individual to different sites, but where you've got SPD generation or you've got um, complexity of the Ram Reserve Matters application, Section 106, infrastructure, mm -hmm. all of those, you know, we know, and I'm sure there are examples in the authority, where those have extended well beyond the, I think it's 27 months, which is the upper end of their leading time. Thank you. Do the council want to comment on them? Yeah, probably some just some useful context on the three sites from a residential perspective. Um, with regard to the former Ironbridge power station, the first residential phase of development has now commenced. Uh, so develop, they're on site uh, con uh, constructing that development uh, as we speak. Uh, we have statements of common ground with the uh, site promoters of uh, both Brid 30, uh, Tasley Garden Village, and uh, the CEG site, which are uh, HR 158, 160, 161. Uh, and within those statements of common ground, uh, I think without putting words in the mouth of the promoters, I think. The general position is, the view is that the council is slightly cautious in terms of our assumptions about delivery rates and time scales. Uh, but, Mom, you've got those statements of common ground that it's uh, SOCG 18 and SOCG 13. So, obviously, you've got that before you. Um, the council's view is that we take a cautious approach to delivery rates and, uh, and lead in times to ensure that we have confidence about the delivery of our overall requirements. And the same applies to the, the contribution uh, to the black country. It's just to confirm that in the statements coming from with uh, the Shrewsbury uh, proposal, the CEG, we do talk about 
uh, the phasing of delivery uh, six uh, six in these times common ground with them uh, and uh, just reading it through build out rates are expected to uh, peak uh, twenty nine to thirty six and uh, will be completed by the end of the pump period it's thirty eight so that is the position from the site site promoter uh, we have this year. Yeah, and we actually assume in our supply that that site will be developed beyond the plan, but the uh, site promoter is saying they will have built out that site by the end of the plan period. Thank you. You want to come back on any of that, Mr. Pollard? Yep. Um, again, I go back to the point. Um, I'm not under and um, challenging those that confidence and that op optimism. The importance of being able to monitor and manage it effectively and have a plan B very quickly able to be enacted where clearly as we've already highlighted and the discussions around affordable housing whilst not challenged there is a significant affordable housing need so if we start under delivering it, it rapidly becomes a, a much more significant issue and challenge in terms of under provision of affordable housing as well market housing more widely so it comes back to the the importance of being able to monitor and manage and react proactively. Thank you. Mr Thomas. Yes, thank you, Mom. I, I was really just, as you know, I was sitting here, just uh, verifying what Mr West had said, that that's uh, certainly our understanding and you know, supporting the council in that position. Uh, we have a, a agreed statement of common ground. We're, we've got a planning performance agreement as well that sits alongside that, and we're actively working with the council to bring forward the development as soon as we can. So, thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Mr Oakley, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah thanks very much, Mr. Um, um, you have our um, response to this question in the statement, so I won't repeat that. Um, it's really alluding to how the Black Country provision will be dealt with or addressed through monitoring through the housing and supply statement uh, updates, and the council have provided some um, helpful clarification on that. Where my view, my sort of uh, thoughts on this is what the or what provisions could be put into the plan where land supplies assessed against the standard method potentially in five years' time when the plan reaches its five year anniversary. I would suggest that the council probably won't have an updated as a requirement in place or has a requirement in place in five years. So it's how the council intend to address. The unmet, need, the unmet need supply or the supply for the unmet need in its own calculations because we've seen across the country recently Malvern Hills, Tewkesbury, Warwick where cases have been made where under the standard method supply that is to meet needs from neighbours should not be counted within the local authorities overall land supply calculations that need effectively goes back and therefore the supply goes back at five years when the plan reaches five years, because the, the land supply assessment is based on the standard method figure, which is a needs only, a local needs only figure. So just welcome some clarification from the council on that. And if they haven't got any clarification on that, then we would propose that some modifications be inserted into the plan to recognise that that need from the black country and therefore the supply would go back to the black country at that point in time when the uh, plan reaches five years and the standard method is triggered for land supply purposes. Thank you. I'll ask the council to respond. Uh, I think we're dealing a little bit in, in the uncertain areas again here, I think, about what frameworks will say. And I'm, I'm, I think, you know, we've set out a clear position about how we were going to meet the 1500 and the Obviously, talking about housing today, so the fifteen hundred houses uh, for the BC need. Uh, just, I'm curious about what why we would want to maybe confuse matters with a main modification. In that, we've set out how we would monitor that as part of our overall requirement. The fifteen hundred is incorporated into our overall requirement, and the uh, with an up-to-date plan, our housing land supply would be monitored against that. So I'm, I, 
I don't see a rationale for why we would uh, want to you disaggregate it out, can you, when you're, when you're looking yeah. at the... Uh, the I think the, con the, the concern being expressed, I think, was, well, what happens in five years' time when under the current NPPF you would stop monitoring against your requirement figure and would, re and would monitor against a standard method figure? Well, the, the answer is we don't know what's going to, what national policy is going to be in five years' time. Um, and whatever national policy is in five years' time, um, anybody who reads the local plan will read that 1,500 of the, um, the total requirement was for the black country. And, and we'll make a planning judgment at that time, alongside whatever whatever national policy says at that time. Yeah, I think the important thing is, isn't it, with these things? Um, I think it's when you come to Section seventy eight, often that that's the issue, and that's why it's important that the plan. I think we have set that out originally. The why the plan separated out, and it was very clear how you monitor and manage those numbers just like if you've got a set trajectory for example you need to be really clear about how that's operating so that you could, you don't have big discussions at um at section 78 inquiries sure. <laughs> does that hands have, well, have, we, have we got the wrong end of the stick the, the requirement is the, the council the, the the plan is based on one requirement and at an appeal scenario in five years time the council will be tested against a single requirement. That requirement includes an element from, and their land supply assessment against that requirement would be inclusive of um, a black country supply from what the council is suggesting. But what we're suggesting is that at that point in time, that supply is not to meet Shropshire's needs, it is to meet the black country's needs. And therefore, a, a five year supply scenario should not include that black country proportion. Now, if there's a point in time where we get to five years and the, and the sites aren't being delivered according to the trajectory, and we've heard from the council that they expect some of these sites to deliver way beyond the plan period, so we can almost inevitably get to the point where some of that unmet need or the supply to address that unmet need will not have been delivered, and therefore the council could, in theory, portion that as part of their supply calculations. And that's what we're seeking in terms of clarification is what the council would do. And I think that's something that can be done through, through a modification. It can just be what the council states it intends to do. Does the council want to add anything? We don't know what national policy might require us to do. That's the point. The assumption being made is that national policy will be as it is today. Seems importantly that you'll have the evidence. You, you'll have to be able to pull the evidence yes. that you need to be able yes. to separate it out yeah. it, as you need to. Be, yeah. That's the important exactly right. Thing. I mean, if, if anybody wants to know in five years' time whether the meeting the fifteen hundred for the black country is on track mm. or is ahead of itself or is behind itself, that information will be available transparently in the public domain. Yeah. Well, that's that's in terms of past delivery. But I'm talking about forward supply. I can see the point, uh, but equally, I'm, I can, I'm a bit loath to do this because obviously that, that's not what's agreed in the Stones of Common Ground with the Black Country. You know, we have effectively said we would meet that proportion of their need within the plan period. So, um, you know, I don't really want to revisit that again because that's not included in the Stones of Common Ground. Uh, so, um, if we were to propose a main modification, which I think is what uh, Mr. Oak is indicating that. You know, there might be something written into the plan to say yeah, after five years of, of monitoring. Yeah, I mean, I'm not questioning that you'll deliver what you're saying you'll deliver. Yeah. Are we supportive of the 1500? It's, it's just what happens if it's a, it's a contingency. Yeah. But it helps to clarify, it's the clarification that would reduce the debates at Section 70 appeals. I'll, I'll have a think about what's been said. And... Thank you. Is there any points on that? So the next question is uh, five. Does the plan identify a developable supply and, a, and or broad locations in years six to ten and where possibly years 11 to 15 necessary to maintain continuity of deliverable supply? 
including an appropriate buffer for changing circumstances. So obviously we've got a separate session on five-year housing land supply um, in, I'm not sure, I can't remember what week, but in a, um, November sometime. Um, so this really just is focusing on that latter stage of the plan period. Does anybody want to make any comments on that? Mr Pierce. Uh, thank you, just a, a small point. Um, Appendix 7 of the pre submission draft plan has the table setting out where the sites are identified and in which period. Second, Mr Oakley, can you just turn your microphone off, Sorry. please? It's just... uh, so, so um, Appendix 7 of the pre submission draft plan has the table setting out where each of the sites are intended to be delivered. Um, I think it was just a point we made in our statement about the time periods. Obviously, the short term time period has now elapsed or will have elapsed by the time the plan's adopted. And whether there's a need to just update that, roll it forward to the date of adoption. Yeah, I mean, that, that probably would make sense. I don't know if the council have got any comment on that. It probably is. But that would be something you would do before adoption, isn't it? You'd update that as a main modification. I don't think we've got any concerns with that principle. What I would say is there are a, a few sites that have actually commenced. Um, so if we were to exclude that period, we wouldn't be able to reflect the fact that some of them were actually under construction in that period. So I think if we were to update, I think we'd keep the same time periods, but just update when we anticipate sites coming forward within it. It's it's interesting because obviously this gets to the heart of that whole point that we discussed about the trajectory. And it's a good example of the fact that obviously plan is a snapshot in time. This was at submission. Uh, it shows the, limit, the value and limitation of having that sort of approach in a plan as opposed to a, a, a document like the five year supply, which is annually reviewed. Um, so that information obviously is reflected in the most up to date five year supply. And, We've got updated assumptions for all the sites in terms of when we anticipate them coming forward. Uh, but yeah, in principle, we've got no problem with updating that, that appendix to uh, to reflect most available, most up-to-date information. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we've just made a note of that main modification. That's the first one we've come across, isn't it? Where we've all agreed that I think that's probably necessary. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think people would want to see it, wouldn't they? But I well, there's two ways, isn't it? You could do it as through the main mods, it would be slightly out of date when you adopted, but not that much. We'd... Yeah. We can, yeah, we can decide on that later, but it needs modified. I think that's the, the gist of it, isn't it? And uh, yeah. I, I always you could do. I always think of minor ones more like typos and little things. That seems more substantial to me than that. So um, I think it's probably better if it was a main model. Mr. Rich is on that point. We will not be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is anybody else? Did you have your? No. Okay. So the next question is about the SAM dev site. So, so the council relies on those obviously to meet the overall need. And we've had quite a lot of discussion about this at stage one hearings. And since then, the council has done some work that we requested. So there's a little bit more detail on those in the plan. Um, and they're, they're mentioned in more detail in policy SP2 as well. So there is sort of that reference to them. Um, the question is about what evidence there is to show the sites will come forward now. So there's obviously um, the plan period for the SAM dev is up to 2026. So um, it's not it's not gotten beyond that yet. We've got a couple of years left, but there is still Quite a number of sites that have not come forward and as there's a range isn't there some some are built out some have got planning permission some have got no planning permission so there's a whole um, range of different 
things, but there are quite a lot that still even don't have planning permission. So the question was really about that um, and what evidence is there that those sites will come forward. Some are obviously more significant than others, the sort of larger sites. Do you want to say anything before we start? I think all I would say is the, the evidence is most, I think, eloquently captured in our housing land supply information where obviously we monitor uh, that information uh, and it's uh, through, you know, as we, as you know, in discussions with agents, landowners, landowners, developers, um, and come to a, a view on on uh, likely delivery rates. So uh, I think that is the position of the council on that. And I think what you've got in GC51, I think it is, isn't it? It's the most up-to-date position is our most up-to-date position in terms of our view on the, uh, the build-out of those uh, proposed allocations, like the uh, existing sites uh, that we are proposing to roll over into the new plan. Thank you. We'll discuss that more when we look at five-year housing land supplies. Like that's where it's a little bit more critical, but does anybody want to say anything at this stage on those sites? I appreciate sort of the additional evidence that the, the council have um, sort of provided on, on the justification for um, carrying over the, the, the Sandev site. So um, I, I think our sort of view is, yes, they should still be, if they're allocated, they should be in the, the plan. Um, and I think that uh, the, the, the evidence provided is is for you to just sort of decide whether that um, is sufficient sort of evidence to demonstrate that they are deliverable and they are capable of being allocated. Um, just one query, just in relation to the, the sites that have been identified as being in the club attachment and subject to nutrient neutrality. Um, as with nutrient neutrality sites, one would hope that there is a solution at some point. Um, it's just whether that falls within a five-year period or whether they, as a result of that, it needs to be pushed back to a later delivery period. Um, so maybe that falls into the five-year land supply sort of session rather than this one, but... I think those sites that are affected from memory, I know you've dealt with this more as well, Tell you that are, are further down the plan period, the ones that are affected, are they so that that allows for that to be resolved one way or another? Yes. Okay. Do you want to say any more on that? No. No. Miss Wilson. Uh, yes, thank you, Mom. Um, I, I appreciate that this is uh, something that will be uh, considered in greater detail at the uh, Matter Twenty Five uh, Five Year Housing Land Supply Session. I suppose it, it's it, it's really um, uh, for the inspectors to be confident that the evidence adduced demonstrates that the sites are indeed available um, and, and deliverable. Um, and, and what I would say is. Um, there are a number of instances within the uh, updated five-year housing land supply um, paper, uh, I think it's GC 47, um, which effectively said there are known developer interests or that there are, you know, landowners that we think are willing, um, I, I, you know, and, and I would query whether that meets the tests of deliverability. Uh, and, and surely the onus is on the council to demonstrate that they will um, actually come forward. Um, so if there is an opportunity for the council in advance of the matter 25 sessions to perhaps look to agree whether it be statements of common ground or at least adduce some kind of pro forma for the comfort of the inspectors in terms of ensuring that those sites are actually deliverable at the moment i would have some concerns that what is set out within that uh, within gc 47 does not go anywhere close enough to demonstrating that those sites are actually available and will actually deliver within the plan period at all Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Do you want to come back on, Mr. Cardin? Uh, just, just briefly. Um, obviously, we're going to ha have a, uh, a specific discussion about the five-year land supply uh, in the future matter. Um, what I would note is obviously there is a distinction between deliverable sites included in your five-year housing land supply and developable sites included in the the wider land supply. Uh, that's specifically recognised in the MPPF, and it is those definitions of deliver deliverable and developable that the council applies when assessing sites. That's explained within uh, the House and Land Supply GC 47, uh, and I think that's that's quite an important distinction that that needs to be recognised when when you consider the wider land supply. Thank you. Do you want to come up? And 
Uh, no, Mom, save for, for, for just a, a brief comment saying that as part of the local plan process, the council will have considered whether the sites were suitable, available and achievable. And effectively, you know, uh, the, the query with regards to availability and achievability, intrinsically, you do need to know that there is a landowner or a developer on board that is, is, is you know, willing to, to allow that site to come forward. Thank you. So question seven, the council's housing and employment topic paper, so GC45, which we've been through quite a lot. Um, so table 10.1 includes Schlar sites as part of the housing land supply. Um, so the question is about what are these sites and why were they not allocated in the plan? Are they different to windfalls? I think we've touched on this on other days um, as it happens in these sorts of um, hearing sessions um, as we get further along. Things tend to be replicated. So it might be worth just for any, the benefit as well of anybody not here, what, what the difference is and why those um, why those Schlar sites. So a lot of councils, Schlar sites are windfalls. Um, why have you disaggregated them out in, in, in that way? So I think they're on category G and J, isn't it? So you've got two separate lines there. Uh, the, the council specifically considers Schlar sites to be windfall. The distinction between the category G and J is that in the housing land supply, the council makes a specific allowance for small windfall sites of less than five dwellings, whereas solar sites and other forms of windfall in the supply are for five or more dwellings. So there isn't an overlap. It's just recognising the distinction in scale. So the only allowance we make for larger windfall sites is where they are identified through the strategic land availability assessment or through uh, the en engagement that our housing enablement offices undertake for, for affordable housing sites. Um, so, but they are they are a form of windfall now. Thank you. Does anybody want to say anything about that? No, I think we've stood the cool. uh, Again, sorry, it's only a, a quick point really is that, um, yeah, it, it seems that the, the council are uh, clarifying that those are windfall sites and are grateful for that clarification. The, the question is really uh, surrounds table 10.1. And again, it's applying some broad maths to those figures. So essentially what we're saying is that row J, the 3588 figure, broadly speaking, that's 10% of the supply. It's slightly more, but for sake of argument, it's 10% of the supply. When you add the 622 to that, again, broadly speaking, that's 12% of the supply. The question I have really is where the evidence is to demonstrate that a 12% windfall allowance is uh, demonstrably achievable. Um, I've had a look around in the, the Schlar and I, I can't see a, a figure that demonstrates that that's sound and can be relied upon for the plan period, but happy to be corrected on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Cook. I'll ask the council to come back on that. Uh, in, in terms of the specific windfall allowance in the supply, we, we've discussed this previously, but just to, to emphasise, um, we consider past trends, uh, we consider uh, things like the strategic land availability assessment, and we consider the, the policy framework and the, the likelihood that that facilitates windfall uh, in, a, in a manner consistent with the MPPF when, when establishing an appropriate windfall allowance. Uh, in terms of the SLAR sites, they are specifically informed by the assessment work that was undertaken within the SLAR, which looks at suitability, availability, achievability and viability. Uh, and only those sites that were considered accepted, uh, which is effectively where they are consistent with policy, come forward without the need for allocation, are included within the land supply. Uh, and that, that's one of the reasons why we, we haven't proposed to allocate them, because effectively the, the, the policies in the plan facilitate their delivery without the need for their allocation. Um, that is the evidence that we draw upon to, to establish the supply. Um, obviously, there is a distinction between the total supply and that required to achieve the housing requirements uh, in that table. 10.1 demonstrates the, the capacity to deliver 34,874 dwellings, uh, whereas obviously the housing requirements is 31,300. What that demonstrates is that there's flexibility in the supply but obviously not the entirety of that is required to achieve the proposed housing requirements. So it, 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 just to pick up on that last point, I think it's quite important because it, we're talking about uh, Mr. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about the 12% being the proportion of 
of the supply figure, but obviously that's the supply figure is not the same as the requirement figure. And where we were yesterday, we're saying our council's case around uh, compelling evidence around windfall allowances is to say we need 1500 uh, windfall to come forward uh, over the plan in order to meet the housing requirement. Not, not that's the difference. Okay, on that one. So just make sure everyone's clear on that one. Uh, just it's a, an important distinction, I think. Yeah. So what, I think the cal based on the calculations I've done, it's twelve percent of the overall supply and thirteen and a half percent of the requirement. I got it. To... That's correct. So this, the total is four thousand two hundred and ten. You add them together. G and J. That's the figure I have. If that helps. <laughs> That's. Yes, yeah, so it's twelve percent of the supply and thirteen and a half percent of the requirement. That's the right. figures I got. When you're asking the question that Mr. Cook asked, is that achievable? Yeah. You need to bear in mind that what we own, what we need to achieve over the remaining years of the plan period, and in in order to achieve those two percentages, is another fifteen hundred. Yeah, which is which is see yesterday's discussion. So just going quickly back to the point on why they weren't allocated, you said it's because there's policies in the plan to facilitate those, but there, there must be other sites that you have allocated that could come forward based on policies in the plan that, so, you know, they're not necessarily not green belt sites or green field sites or whatever. The majority of the proposed allocations in the plan are green field sites on the edge of settlements or new strategic settlements, if you like. Um, there are a limited number of brownfield sites where we felt it was appropriate to provide additional certainty um, about their status. Um, but in the majority, they are sites that would have required amendments to development boundaries policies in order to facilitate their delivery. The SLA sites that are in the, the land supply are effectively uh, sites identified within development boundaries. Um, that have like brownfield sites or or infill opportunities that are identified and the policies would facilitate their delivery. Um, so the council was of the view that it's unnecessary to allocate them to facilitate that development taking place. Thank you. Mr. Oakley, you have You just put your mic on. Sorry. Slightly flippant, I think, but I'm, I'm just I'm just really confused by why the council would have a separate category for sites that aren't or two or two categories of sites that aren't allocated, Schla sites and windfall sites. I, I just don't. I don't understand. I, think I just don't understand. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was confused, but I think we've just explained they've sort of split them out based on size. I still don't get the explanation. So. Uh, well, in the housing land supply, there's a number of categories that aren't allocated sites, actually. So you've got sites with planning permission. Many of them aren't allocations. They'll be windfall. Same with, in fact, no prior approval sites or allocations because they're sites that uh, get put, uh, effectively it's a form of PD where a prior approval is required, so they're not allocated. Uh, you could argue they're all windfall developments. Um, emerging affordable housing sites are not allocations. Um, and the windfall and the SLAR sites that we've already referenced and our allocations. I don't think that's unusual. Uh, that, that's the way most councils house and land supply is, con that's what most councils house and land supply consists of. It's known sites with sites that are committed with planning permission or prior approval, and then sites that are allocated and then an appropriate approach to windfall. The way we've taken it is we've distinguished between the smaller sites and the larger sites, recognizing that uh, we have a rich tradition of, of windfall and Shropshire. Yeah, I understand the commitments point. That's common to do, but it's it's how you it's that sort of future potential, if you like, the unknowns that are split out, isn't it? That's not yeah. not always done. I've not, I've not seen any other approach in any other plan that's done this specifically. I can't recall any. There is a windfall allowance, but those are for sites you just don't know about. Small sites usually, aren't they? Less than five, sometimes less than ten. But I, yeah, I mean. It's just for yourselves to, to to deliberate over this, isn't it, Spectrum? But so we'll register our complete confusion at this approach. Thank you.
from those man, uh, apologies for Mr. Oak, who's, I suppose, uh, in terms of terms of the confusion that he has on this, but uh, this is a an approach that this council has undertaken for many years in terms of calculating the five year supply. And as most councils have, uh, been subject to significant inquiries and and public hearings uh, on, say, on, on in regarding the credibility of the five year supply on that one. So uh, I, I don't share the level of confusion. Uh, I I'm entirely comfortable with it. Um, I apologise that Mr. Oakley isn't. Thank you. What's well, something for us to take away? I think that one. Hear what you say. So, oh, Mr. Pollard, you want to? Yes, yeah, so well, it's slightly separate point, and I guess, and apologies as this has been picked up in matters one and two, but I guess it's just hearing some of those figures, the 13.5% of the requirements, and then the, the observation there about the time spent, effort spent, defending windfalls at section 78, and et cetera. I'm just thinking this is an opportunity in a plan-led system to provide more certainty and overcome some of those challenges and issues. It's just the extent to which that's been considered in terms of the, a sustainable approach where clearly allocations um, have the benefit of being more plan led in terms of being able to identify infrastructure, et cetera, to mitigate their impact. Cumulative impact of over 4,000 dwellings isn't insignificant on community infrastructure, housing, schools, et cetera, uh, schools and health facilities. So the extent to which that is factored into that, and apologies if it has been picked up under matters one and two, but just the, you know, there are other sites perhaps that have that infrastructure, you know, that have that plan-led ability beyond relying on windfall. Thank you, Mr. Paul. I don't to come back on that. Yeah, as you're picking up on the last point about infrastructure, just to, just to clarify really that the conversations with infrastructure providers is based upon its overall requirements and guidelines for settlements, not only allocations. So we do take into account guidelines, which obviously assume in some instances a degree of windfall uh, within that. So. I would argue, and the council would argue, that that conversation around future plan-led infrastructure has been captured in those uh, conversations with infrastructure providers as part of the plan-led process. Thank you, Ms. Um, Wilson. Thank you, Ron. Um, for what it's worth, I, I share Mr. Oakley's confusion, um, but I think. Uh, Obviously, I've, I've made uh, representations on behalf of both clients with regard to this um, somewhat extensively over the last couple of days. What, what I would also note is that the uh, and, and at the risk of offending every developer around the table, developers are simple um, and they like certainty. Um, and with particular regard to the way in which the council have split out the Schlar sites and, and the windfall sites and, and the explanation, as I understand it, is that the Schlar sites are, are larger sites that we, we generally speaking, wouldn't understand to fit within the, the, the most widely held concept of what a windfall site is. Um, they like certainty. They like the certainty and an allocation would support certainty, particularly with regards to the, the reference made by Mr. Corden to, to those predominantly being sites within settlement boundaries. Uh, so inherently brownfield sites where there may be some additional viability considerations to take into account. Um, but simply put, the development sector would prefer allocations they, they they simply would that that's uh, that goes without saying what i would also say on a second point is um the degree to which this helps local residents understand where development is going to come forward as well uh, we, we all know that you know by and large development is controversial um and and you know i, I think it, it's fair to say that local residents would benefit from understanding very specifically um where the council intend or, or hope or wish for sites to come forward, that would help local residents to have some understanding and assurity in terms of the input, in, input that they could have into the, the process um, and also help them to understand where and when development is expected to come forward. Thank you. Not to comment on that, I feel like you've covered it. I think we've covered it, uh, really. Uh, it's just in terms of the certainty point, 
uh, around communities, you know, does go back to how we consulted on this plan as well. You know, we have uh, boundaries development uh, for a number of settlements, uh, and we have consulted on those throughout this process. I would also make make the point. I don't. I don't know. I'm, I've done this for, for sure, but I, I, I think that uh, none of the, uh, the the SLAR sites, the owners of the SLAR sites have objected to their lack of allocation throughout this process. So it might be that uh, as a general developer point, but not of those landowners in this process. So uh, obviously, if they had done, we may have responded, but we haven't had that. Thank you. Mr. Pierce, did you want to say? Oh, sorry, Miss Coon. I'll go to Miss Coon first. I think she had her um, toddler on. Up. Sorry, and and, and I, I know that we dealt with with windfall an awful lot yesterday, so I'm, I'm just not going to to go back into that. However, I think there is a point to make here that the use of a SLA site as a sort of windfall esque site. Um, means that it entirely has not been through the local plan process. So you have, on the one hand, uh, to accept the council has identified these sites as, as deliverable, but on the other, uh, there has been no uh, investigation or examination of them, uh, and therefore they fall within a, a particularly anomalous position uh, and... Uh, are, are, do not help with, with soundness. I know that we're dealing with supply later on, but there is a there is a difficulty, uh, Madam, as far as I can see, in using a SLA site that doesn't have uh, any particular status and has not been the subject of examination. Thank you. Uh, just just a couple of points. The first is, in terms of examination, you are obviously considering the policy framework that the council is proposing. That policy framework is used to determine whether windfall proposals are appropriate. So the methodology used to determine applications for windfall development is before you for examination. Secondly, in terms of windfall, paragraph 71 of the MPPF explains the, the factors that should be considered by councils when determining if there's compelling evidence for a windfall allowance, and it specifically references strategic housing land availability assessments. That is in, in a structured context, we call it the SLAR um, because obviously it also looks at economic development as well, but that is that document. Um, what we have sought to do is to distinguish between small windfall sites and large windfall sites. So the, the specific allowance and the supplies for small sites of less than five dwellings. The only allowance for windfall on large sites is for those identified within the supply. I would argue that's a, a very cautious approach based on the evidence we have about larger site scale windfall developments, we could have incorporated a larger allowance for windfall, but the council is of the view that by identifying the specific sites in the SLA and rely, relying on those identified sites, it provides greater certainty that the supply is deliverable. That's the approach we consider is appropriate in this context, and that, that is the justification for it. If there was confusion, I mean, an alternative approach is to simply make a larger windfall allowance. What the council considers this is providing greater certainty in terms of the distinction of the types of windfall sites that we're reliant on. Ms. Coe, do you want to say any more? Well, I, I, I think that, that it kind of makes the point for us because the... <laughs> You're either, I mean, this is what we discussed yesterday. This is the approach the council has taken. It is, it is not what many other authorities do. It is a mixture between identification of the sites and then stepping back and saying, but it might be windfall. So it falls within a, a rather odd gap uh, in, in my submission in terms of what the guidance says uh, uh, and, and the way that you are supposed to um, make a decision about whether there are sufficient sites and sufficient supply. And Madam, the guidance does indeed refer to the SLA as, as a means of identifying windfall, but it doesn't say identify the specific sites from the SLA. It is to give an idea of, of, of potential windfall, and that is it. So that's why it, I, I think that there are concerns about um, how 
how the council has approached it and what you are being asked to accept. Um, uh, but but the, it's uh, I, I know it's a slightly esoteric point, but but there is a difficulty we think in, in this approach. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I understand the, the council's distinction between small windfalls and slightly larger windfalls or slar sites. Um, I think on the, the, the small windfalls, yeah, that they come forward yeah, unexpectedly, as windfalls do. Yeah, that there's no need to sort of demonstrate that they are deliverable because you know, they will come forward as applications, as and when you know, the opportunity arises. The, the, the query or the concern I've got, though, is about the, the larger windfalls. And clearly, they've been included within the supply. Um, and obviously, having been included in the supply, the council must consider that they are deliverable. And the, the basis of considering that they are deliverable is based on the 2018 SLA. So that's now five years old. And there doesn't appear to be an update to it. And I suppose the question is, are the council still content that the conclusions and the availability of those sites would still render those sites deliverable over the, you know, the next five years, 10 years and 15 year period? Thank you. Can council answer that in terms of? Yes, ma'am. Um, as detailed within our five year housing land supply statement, GC 47, uh, specifically within uh, paragraphs 5.101 to 5.110, the starting point is the conclusions within the SLAR. When we prepare each iteration of the five year land supply statement, we then review the suitability, availability, achievability, viability of the all sites within our supply, including the SLA sites, uh, that assessment is summarised within uh, Appendix G of the five-year land supply statement. Uh, so we're not reliant on 2018 assumptions. We review them annually to ensure that we consider we have a robust position with regards to either the deliverability or developability of SLA sites, because not all of them are included within the five-year period, because there's a recognition of lead-in times and delivery rates. and that those assumptions are updated annually to ensure that we have a robust position with regard to those sites. Thank you. Anybody else want to say anything on this point before we, Mr. Kells? Sorry, ma'am, and I, I am resisting going over everything that I said on Windfalls yesterday, but I just wanted to pick up um, a couple of points. Um, the first one is um, I, I can see the difficulty with putting these into various separate uh, compartments, and part of it comes from this. The MPPS doesn't make this distinction between small and large windfalls, um, and uh, yet local authorities often do it and, and in a way which therefore adds to confusion. So there may be a way of making it clearer in, in this table that these are um, windfall sites. Um, there were just two other points on it. Um, the first one is in terms of um, certainty of the provision of infrastructure um, in relation to this. Um, the first thing is that Windfall sites won't not come forward because they're not in the supply. It's a very obvious point. They come forward because they're windfall sites. So any infrastructure issues that will uh, come forward will come forward whether or not they're in or outside the plan. Um, and I assume because the council has, um, you know, we, we, we think there should be a higher number of windfalls. The council has um, shown that it's, it's dealt with windfalls over the last, uh, five years to a considerable extent, and I would assume that in the process of that, the infrastructure issues have been dealt with, and those windfalls have been delivered within the planning process. So I, th I think that gives some confidence on on that. So I think in terms of that fact that, that the the windfalls will come forward, and those infrastructure issues will have to be dealt with, whether or not they that just because they're not in the plan doesn't doesn't kind of you take them out of the supply, doesn't get rid of that. Um, and the other clear, clear point is, it's important to note that, as people have said, this amounts to about 12%. But that means that 88% of all development 
is not the, the consequence of that is that a large amount is not on windfall sites so infrastructure will be provided based on that so i think it can be overestimated the the fact that there will be some uncertainty and that, and that would apply you know there will be infrastructure issues anyway so i just wanted to make that those, those couple of points on it um uh, as i say i i i won't repeat all the other things that we said thank you the council it was just a point really about infrastructure provision on 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 windfall sites as well because just, just a, a wider point really about again going back to developer contributions and particularly around the sill uh, obviously the sill is payable on all open market dwellings uh, uh yes there's a few restrictions on that or a few uh, exemptions from that but uh, uh there's no reason i think for us at this point to say that there wouldn't be developer contributions to support mitigating infrastructure needs from windfall as part of those developer contributions. So it's, it, there's an inbuilt process in the planning process, which we operate here in Shropshire to cater for that perhaps small scale infrastructure need from, from small, uh, well, any uh, uh, windfall development. Thank you. Ms. Wilson. Uh, yes, thank you, Ma'am. Um, it's just, I suppose with regards to that, that, that specific answer there. Mr. Kells, can you just turn your microphone? Oh, I'm so sorry. Apologies. Um, so, so yeah, just with, with regard to uh, to that point in regard to infrastructure, I, again, you know, noting the position with regards to affordable housing, which I, I, I've duly made, I, I think if we refer to Table 10.2, um, which is the uh, of uh, the updated housing and employment topic paper, um, we, we can see that uh, you know, some of the windfall allowance, which I'm assuming within this table comprises both the SLAR sites and indeed windfall sites, somewhat confusingly. Um, you know, some of the numbers that are expected to be delivered here are, are quite significant. So, for example, in Ellesmere, we've got 130 dwellings. Now, when we're talking about infrastructure, you know, if you had a single application coming forward for 130 dwellings, that would be subject to a greater degree of scrutiny in terms of the requirements for supporting technical evidence. It would inherently require um, affordable housing. There would be consideration of the uh, highway impact in terms, in, including the cumulative highway impact um, in addition to the existing and proposed allocations. Um, and, and simply put, the council's approach does not does not prevent a scenario where you effectively get thirteen applications for ten dwellings coming forward that are simply not subject to that same scrutiny or that same level of investigation in terms of the cumulative impact. Now, theoretically, the council's approach could allow for thirteen sites within reasonably close proximity. I'm not saying that that land is available to do so, but there is no mechanism by which the council can resist that and you know there is there is nothing required for a smaller application that is going to be anywhere near as significant as a level of evidence to demonstrate cumulative impacts and deliverability and the impact on wider infrastructure or services including you know the degree to which section 106 contributions are sought so it is a substantive point that you know simply simply saying 130 dwellings in Ellesmere um, that's fine, but but you know, you are you are failing to have regard to the impact of that 130 dwellings on on the infrastructure availability, including the highway network. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just going back on that, just to reiterate a, a point I made early on uh, about the more strategic infrastructure requirements uh, have been through through discussions with infrastructure infrastructure providers and that process is a live issue as well and will continue. Uh, and that is based upon overall guidelines for settlements. So where we say a settlement will deliver X, there is an assumption around with an infrastructure provider around what is the impact of delivering X in terms of a guideline, not necessarily just the sites we propose in the plan. In terms of your other point um yeah. this will, sorry, you're right yeah, yeah. Um, around uh, the uh around the cumulative impact of development because uh, i think you, you mentioned that a few times i would go 
that is precisely what the seal is there to do. You have section 106 agreements, which are for individual uh, planning applications. Individual, you know, it, it's it's how how applications look after th their own impact. The seal is around specifically around catering for that cumulative impact of a number of developments on a community. Uh, so I would say you, you've answered my point on that one. So awesome. Thank you. Any other? OK, so we'll move to uh, question eight. I think we might have covered this already. Should windfalls be counted as part of the housing supply for years one to five and years 11 to 15? I think that's maybe been already answered in other ways. <laughs> yeah, there's only so much you can say about windfalls in the end. <laughs> um, question nine again. Um, I think we've again talked about paragraph 71 of the framework, um, which talks about the need for compelling evidence that windfall allowances for large and small sites would represent a reliable source of housing supply. Does the approach to windfall sites avoid double counting? So I think this was something that was raised by um, somebody. Are there any comments on that? Again, I think we've probably covered quite a lot of that. Okay. Um, question 10. So table 8.5 of the Council's Housing and Employment Topic Paper contains information described as known significant potential windfall development opportunities, which is quite a mouthful. Can they be classed as windfalls if they are already known? And again, I think this, this is something we've talked about at quite a lot of length um, and whether they should be allocated in the plan, how likely they come forward during the plan period as some have had planning permission in the past, which have now lapsed. Is there any more anybody wants to say on that? I think we've, again, talked about that quite a lot. I think I know people's views on most of it. OK. Um, the next question is quite different. So it's about specialist housing and how that's factored into supply. So the council have obviously provided some information on that in their, um, in their response to this matter. Is there any Anybody want to make any comments on that? Are we? No, I mean, I'm happy just to take as read what you've said. Um, 12, what flexibility does the plan provide if some of the larger sites do not come forward to the council's estimated timescales? The council want to comment on that? I think that partly ties up with things like triggers and uh, sorry, you know, sort of um, review triggers and things, doesn't it? But, uh... Yes. Uh, uh, again, obviously, uh, it's touched upon, I think, by Mr. Pollock, I think, uh, early on, wasn't it, about sort of leading times, I think, on that one. And so, I mean, again, you've got our response, and I think we our, our general view on these things is we take a quite, quite a cautious approach on leading times for development. I think that's probably... Uh, shown to some degree again by pointing to two particular sites from us in the room where the statement of common ground we have would indicate that uh, our approach is a cautious approach more more so compared to their aspirations on the site so i think you know that's one element of, of that and again yes you've mentioned about uh review triggers but again i'll go back to in terms of uh, uh you know in terms of settlement specifics you know, in terms of guidelines around around, around settlements, again, the, we do have the proposed policy SP7, uh, which again uh, does uh, have an inbuilt um, mechanism where the council believes that the overall guideline isn't being met. And obviously, if there's a, one particular large, large proposal, which is very significant in the overall delivery of that the guideline, that would be a, a significant consideration in those conversations. So. I think that there's quite a lot of inbuilt flex within the plan itself. I think what you've just said there, Mark, was about inbuilt mechanisms for actually local plan review in itself entirely. I think our starting position is we're happy with our position, uh, as is, with inbuilt flex into that plan already uh, and that cautious approach. If it, but it but equally re re recognise that, you know, one, there's a national picture here which might require an early review in any case, and you again, it's obviously in your hands a little bit there about whether you 
you considered an early review mechanism is required as well. So again, happy to have that conversation separately or if that's okay. I mean, that's all I really wanted to say on that here, unless there was anything specifically you wanted to take up. No, that's, that's helpful. Does anybody want to talk, Mr Pollard? Thanks. And again, you've got our hearing statement. I think perhaps, perhaps we differ in terms of a view as to how cautious the council has been. Um, I'll leave you to read Appendix 1 and the information in there. But, you know, I don't think it's too difficult to apply some different assumptions and suddenly find quite a large gap of more than 2,000 homes. <clears throat> so you know, in terms of challenges to whether leading talent have been appropriately applied and therefore whether delivery will occur in the plan period. I think just picking up on some of the conversation in the last few points as well, it's not just the impacts of um, windfalls falling away versus larger sites. I think it's the benefits as well. I think it's not, you know, what is the immediate issue, um, way to, how does the plan respond if these larger sites aren't delivering, recognising they have particular benefits or addressing particular challenges, i.e. they're bringing housing in the right areas, the areas that have been identified, or they're bringing bypasses or infrastructure or particular mitigation messages for education. So I don't necessarily agree with the council in terms of that the, the kind of it's fine, the review will sort itself out is appropriate. I think it needs a, a firmer review mechanism and a clear indication of exactly what happens if under delivery is occurring with particular reference to the larger sites, those out, those settlements which are expecting greater proportions of delivery and the, without raising it again, the unmet need point as well, the sites there. Thank you. Got to come back now. Okay. Ms. Wilson. Uh, thank you, Mum. Please forgive me. I'm, I may have made this point yesterday, or I may have dreamt that I made this point yesterday. So um, if I did, I apologise. But I think um, with, with reference to uh, flexibility within the policy, I, I suppose a mechanism by which um, there is scope for addressing where delivery doesn't occur. I, I read policy SP7 criterion for as being very specific to individual settlements, uh, and I maintain that there, there is a, a, a necessary modification that um, allows a, effectively the council to say, OK, so development in Albrighton hasn't reached the level that we would expect it to. Uh, it's not done so within a set period time frame. And rather than, than there being you know, a mechanism by which you could... Uh, release more land in Albrighton or something, effectively it needs to be looked at, at a Shropshire-wide level. Um, you know, the slow delivery in one settlement should not prevent delivery in other settlements, offsetting that in, in you know, in the context of a, a, an urgent need to deliver um, and boost the supply of housing and affordable housing. We got anything more to add, Mr. Just just one point, I think, on that one. The reason why the the inbuilt review mechanism or the inbuilt mechanism in SP seven, uh, which is managing housing development uh, proposed policy, uh, is based on a settlement basis. Is that's what the space that that is the settlement hierarchy, and that is where we have. That is obviously as as per discussions yesterday. That is our. It, it is seeking to focus growth in certain areas around that settlement hierarchy. So I, I don't see the benefit necessarily of having that same mechanism at the sort of county-wide uh, level. Uh, we view it it's more important at the settlement level. Uh, and I would also point out that there are inbuilt uh, mechanisms uh, uh, with the framework in, uh, that apply to councils in in those positions kind of anyway so i think it's uh it's not required to be part of the process there are suitable mechanisms elsewhere uh that require councils to do that in any case uh so that, that was just a couple of points i just wanted to make in, uh to mr wilson uh, mr wilson, mr. wilson. thank you okay so the next question is about the targets for the provision of affordable housing and what's been achieved in recent years. I think we've got the council information. We've talked quite a bit about affordable housing this morning. Is there any 
Um, 14, is the type and size of housing plan provided meeting likely to meet the needs of the area? I'm not sure there was any particularly strong views on this. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? I think I'm happy to take what you've set out on that. Mr Burns, do you want to say something on that? Only that we'll be addressing this point in respect of matter 27. Okay, thank you. And then finally, question 15, is there sufficient variety in terms of the location and type of sites um, allocating? Again, we've touched on that a little, well, probably quite a lot in terms of um, Black Country and various other matters. Is there anything anybody wanted to say here today about that in general terms? No. OK, well, that concludes the session. We were seeing at breakfast this morning, we thought, oh, are we going to get through everything today? <laughs> you never can tell. <laughs> oh, is there anything else? Anybody? Nothing about today, Mum. Uh, you may well want to come on to it anyway, because on uh, the next session on Tuesday morning, I think I had a degree of overspill for this session as well, which clearly is no longer required. So, I mean, it'd be useful to just to clarify what your intention is for... Yes, yeah, so uh, we'll start at 9.30 on Tuesday, but from the top of my head, it's employment matter, five. matter five, isn't it? So oh, we'll just go cool. for... Well, it is, although, although there are there is one inquiry document that suggests overspill from this session. This will be the first thing on Tuesday morning. The agenda for Tuesday morning does start with matter four at 9.30. I yes, so fine. I think we sort of when we were timetabling it, it's because it, we often do the timetable before we even get statements. So we do it yeah. in a kind of fairly flexible way, and then well, it, we kind of develop it as time goes on yeah. as we start to see. I mean, obviously, we just want to make sure that um, somebody who's only interested in matter four doesn't turn up late on Tuesday morning because yes. they think, oh well, matter three will be overrunning. But the event the agenda makes it very clear that they should turn up at 9.30. Yeah, and I wonder if Perry could maybe um just I mean I think probably quite a lot of people here are there tends to be that sort of overlap. Quite a lot of people here are also yeah. probably coming along on um Tuesday. Tuesday. So I'll I'll get Kerry to have a look at that um this afternoon or sometime. And to the attendees for for matter, for matter four, four, saying we will be starting it at 9.30. Yeah, we finished here today. Um, yeah, that's probably quite a useful thing to do. And yeah, it's 9.30 on Tuesday um, and same sort of format and things. I don't, I don't think there's anything else we need to cover. So we've just got that one main modification that's come out of today, hasn't it? That's the whole one that out this week. I think that's the only thing that... It's the only thing that's happened yes. this week. We've got yeah. very excited. We've got our red pens out. <laughs> yes. Um, they tend to be more prevalent when you get to back the, sort of the latter end of the examination. They tend to come in a little bit more faster. OK, well, thanks, everybody, for your help this week. And, uh, yeah, you know, with the slightly darkness and the hammering and the yeah. rain. <laughs> Have safe journeys back, everyone, and we'll see lots of you next week. Thank you.